So thanks for coming to this. Uh, most of you, I think I know just about everybody in the room. My name is Lee Freeman. I'm the local historian on the second floor in the local history genealogy department. And uh, I do lots of different PowerPoint programs on lots of different historical topics. And this has turned into one of my favorites just because it's so interesting. And the ILR people, if you heard it last year, it'll be a little bit different. So there's enough different that I don't think it'll be the same program because as Dr. Osborne says with his uh, Yazoo land fraud program, every time he does it, he does more research and learns more about it. And I have definitely learned more about Henry Ford's bid to lease, or uh, his Ford bid for the Muscle Shoals. So everyone knows about the economic and practical benefits the creation of TVA in 1933 has brought to the Shoals area. However, if you stop and think about it, the Tennessee Valley Authority was not created in a historical vacuum. Had Henry Ford's planned 1921 bid to purchase the nitrate plants in Sheffield, complete construction of the Wilson Dam, lease it from the U.S. government for 100 years, and use them to power an electric utopia 75 miles long with a million residents stretching from Florence in Lauderdale County to Huntsville in Madison County, had this been successful, it's uh, doubtful whether the federal government would have shown any interest in the Muscle Shoals as the site for the TVA in 1933. Uh, I used as a baseline this book, which some of you have probably read by Thomas Hager, Electric City. If you haven't read it, the library has it, and it's a really good read. It's popular history, but it's very well written popular history. He actually came here in 2020 or 2021 to do some research I guess it was before COVID, he came down here. Uh, he originally wrote uh, The Alchemy of Air about uh, fertilizer. And when he came down here, he got a tour. Well, he went, to, he went to TVA, he talked to all the fertilizer people, and they showed him the old uh, nitrate plants, especially uh, nitrate plant number two, or number one in Sheffield. They took him over the old Wilson Dam villages and they told him the story which he'd never heard of. He had the idea that, you know, I think when he thought Alabama, he thought dueling banjos from Deliverance. But he was very pleasantly surprised to find out how educated, cultured, friendly everybody was. And he said, I've never heard this story of Henry Ford. So he wrote a, wrote a book about it. Uh, how many have read it? It's, it's a really good book. So we have it at the library if you haven't read it. And I've used this as my baseline. But what I'm going to be talking most about is the local impact that Ford's bid had on the Muscle Shoals. And I intended to have a show and tell table, but I forgot we drug all the tables out this morning setting the chairs up. So I, I did bring some stuff that if anybody wants to look at, some of it you'll see in the film or in the, in the PowerPoint. Some of it you'll see as slides in the PowerPoint. But there's, we wanted Thomas Hager to come down here and speak, but sadly he passed away last year before he could come down here. And he wasn't an old guy either. He was fairly young, but he passed away before we could get him down here. Well, Wednesday, June 15th, 1921, residents of Florence were shocked when automobile magnet and industrialist Henry Ford arrived in Florence for a surprise inspection tour of the Wilson Dam and U.S. government nitrate plant number two. Ford came to Florence accompanied by his chief engineer, W.B. Mayo, former Sheffield, Alabama engineer, a civil engineer, Mr. John W. Worthington, and W.H. Courtenay, the chief engineer of the l &N Railroad. Pleased with what he saw at the Muscle Shoals on this really quick trip, Ford stated that, quote, he expected to visit Florence frequently, unquote. In return, he did, this time on Saturday, December 3, 1921. And on this second trip, Ford brought with him the great inventor, Thomas Alva Edison. Well, we got to backtrack just a little bit before we can talk about the Wilson Dam and the nitrate plants. We got to back up to the Muscle Shoals Canal, which construction of which was completed in uh, 1890. Construction on the first of two Muscle Shoals canals was begun in 1831 and completed in 1836 at a cost of $644,000 in change, which consisted of seven locks 
However, due to a limited approach at both ends of this canal, few boats ever used it, coupled with a lack of additional funding, and that caused the whole project to uh, be abandoned in 1838. After the Civil War, the government thought revisiting the canal idea would be a good idea, so they revamped and began the construction on the, a second Muscle Shoals Canal in 1875, the Army Corps of Engineers, which was finished in 1890 uh, under the supervision of then Lieutenant George Washington Godels. Anybody know what his later claim to fame was? Panama Canal, but he always said that he thought the Muscle Shoals was a much more impressive achievement in feather in his cap than even the Panama Canal, which kind of surprised me, frankly. The canal would allow river boats to travel safely up the Tennessee River without having to go over or around, they couldn't really go around, the treacherous Muscle Shoals. Well, in 1899, Republican President William McKinley signed a bill introduced by Civil War and Spanish-American War veteran and Democratic Congressman Joseph Fightin' Joe Wheeler that would authorize the building of a dam at the Muscle Shoals. However, the necessary funding couldn't be raised, and three years later, another bid for the creation of a dam and power station at the Muscle Shoals was vetoed by uh, then-President Teddy Roosevelt on the grounds that the bill did not protect the interests of the federal government. Now keep that in the back of your mind. So that Congress authorized a study, actually the War Department, because it was right before World War I that they started the study. Uh, they issued this booklet, America's Gibraltar. Yeah, you, you get the language. Right, at, right before America's going to get into World War I, the Rock of Gibraltar, the English colony that is going to defend Great Britain from the, from the barbarian hordes of the Mediterranean. So they did a study to see whether it would even be feasible or not and where they should put it. So this is, and I have this uh, booklet over here somewhere. Yeah, the library's got three of these. So this is one of those if anybody wants to look at it. Um, with, World War, with, with World War I, came an urgent need for the production of the centretic nitrates used in nitrate explosives. To that end, construction on Wilson Dam and the two nitrate plants began. A number of sites were already chosen in the, and they were in the running. However, President Woodrow Wilson eventually chose the Muscle Shoals, signed the bill authorizing their construction, and the dam was eventually named after him. The new dam was originally known as Dam No. 2, with Dam No. 1 being a small navigation dam built in the canal near the west end of Patton Island. Plans also called for construction of two synthetic nitrate plants in Sheffield, along with two power generating steam plants. Eventually, the dam was supposed to provide the hydroelectric power to power the nitrate plants. In the meantime, they built steam plants to power the nitrate plants until they got the, got the, uh, the dam completed. Construction on nitrate plant number one in Sheffield was completed utilizing the German Haber-Bosch process. However, several complications impeded this plant's full operation, uh, including its inability to operate at the required pressure of 200 atmospheres at 500 to 600 degrees Celsius. Most importantly, ammonia synthesis could not be sustained due to the lack of a sufficient catalyst. Nitrate plant number two was completed just in time for the signing of the armistice, which ended World War I. So they did a little bit at, war, at plant number two, but not very much. And plant number one, they never could get that German process to work because the Germans kept the details top secret and there was a war on. So after the war, when they got a, they got a chance to look at the process in Germany, they said, there's no way we could have made this work but they thought it would at the time. So here's just a few slides of the nitrate plants, what they looked like right after they were constructed. Again, there were two, one in Sheffield, number one, and then number two on what is now the TVA reservation in Muscle Shoals. And of course, they had uh, villages for the officers and employees. So this was constructed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers with the American Cyanamid Company, which was responsible for the plant complex itself. 
but they had uh, they had its uh, it had its own police force. Uh, they had interesting subdivisions. This one laid out in the shape of the Liberty Bell over there in Sheffield. It's hard to tell from the ground, <coughs> but if you look at aerial views like this, you, you can see that that's actually what it is. Of course, this is what it all looks like now, or part of what um, village or uh, plant one looks like nowadays. They've got historic markers, and those old buildings have just sat in there abandoned in some slides of the dam construction, which these photos make that thing, when you're driving across it or look at it from a distance, it doesn't look so big. But in these photos, it looks enormous. It must have been enormous. And it eventually took them till 1926. So from 1918 to 1926 to get the dam completed. And here's some shots of workmen from inside, which are cool. These are from some of these government publications the government progress bulletins. This is from number two, December 1924, which I've got a couple of those if anybody wants to see them later. And there's one of the concrete conduits with the guy standing in the mouth of it. That's just enormous. Imagine the water going through that. It's what, three, three million gallons a second? It's a lot of water. Well, this headline from the Saturday, November 16th, 1918, it, the date on the masthead says 1917. They got the year wrong. It's 1918. From the company newspaper, they, they would do that sometimes, um, says, uh, proclaimed that the recent armistice signed with Germany on November 11th, 1918, would not affect the work on the nitrate plant at Muscle Shoals. But it kind of did, as we've already said a little bit. By 1920, the Republican Congress initiated a series of hearings into alleged waste and mishandling of the hurried wartime construction of the dam and nitrate plants by the Democratic uh, Wilson administration. And it was discovered that the government had spent some $167,163,296, about $5 billion in modern dollars, <clears throat> for two idle nitrate munitions plants and an unfinished dam. The project at that time was still a part of the War Department, so Secretary of War John Weeks was charged with finding somebody, anybody, to take it off the government's hands. And so they had lots of people at various different periods in between 1918 and 1921 inquire, look into it. In March of 1921, Mr. James Russell a representative of the Negro Syndicate Press Bureau and the only African-American journalist to sit in the congressional box toured the nitrate plants in the Wilson Dam with African-Americans E.H. Fields of Sheffield and Professor George W. George N. White, the principal of Burl, along with Colonel Cyrus W. Ashcraft and the Honorable Lee Glenn, representatives of the Florence Chamber of Commerce and both former mayors of Florence, and he noted that African Americans in the South formed a large part of the population, but were chiefly engaged in agriculture and as a class tended to be poor. So Mr. Russell expressed his hopes that the government work of making cheap fertilizer via water power at Muscle Shoals would somehow continue believing that it was in the best interest not only of the African American population, but the population as a whole. Enter Henry Ford. Some said that J.W. Worthington, and you see a young J.W. Worthington on the screen, came up with the idea first. Others said General Lansing Beach, the government's chief dam builder, had the idea first. But it was decided to offer the complex at the Muscle Shoals to auto magnate Henry Ford, who it turns out was already thinking along those lines anyway. Alabama native John Worthington was a civil engineer who moved to Sheffield in Colbert County in the 1890s. Uh, Founded in 1885, at the time, Sheffield was gearing up to become the Birmingham of Northwest Alabama, which it never quite lived up to its, its, uh, dr the dreams they had for it. So it had it experienced a brief boom in the 1880s up to the early 1900s, mid-1900s, and then, I mean, it, it, it just it kind of fizzled out. In 1906, J.W. Worthington and another civil engineer, Frank Washburn, founded the Muscle Shoals Hydroelectric Company, which was bought out by Alabama Power in 1913. In 1907, Washburn founded the American Cyanamid Company, 
which built the nitrate plants between 1917 and 1918. And here they are uh, with Mayo, Weeks, and Ford, Secretary of War Weeks and Henry Ford. With the young, I couldn't find an older picture of John Worthington. And there's a close-up photo of U.S. Secretary of War John W. Weeks. Well, as soon as word got out about Henry Ford's plans, everybody just went Ford crazy. So even the Lawrenceburg papers, and this is from the uh, Florence Herald, uh, Flo uh, this is the Florence paper reporting on celebrations they had in Lawrenceburg, December 9th, 1921, where they had a big Ford demonstration up, up in Lawrenceburg. Everybody was crazy for Ford. Well, no less a personage than Thomas Alva Edison uh, got in on the Ford deal because Ford came to Florence to view the Muscle Shoals project in person, and he did this with the aim of buying the two idle defense plants from the federal government and having the government complete construction on the dam and the nitrate plants and then lease it from the federal government. Ford told Shoals residents that he was a great believer in water power that he used water power as much as possible, building many of his plants where water was readily available. Quote, water power made my profits, unquote, Ford said. Ford ultimately wanted to use the hydroelectric power generated by the dam to power his industries. But when they asked him, are you going to turn out another automobile factory, he said, I've already got one in Detroit that's turning out a million cars a day. Uh, I'm about to begin mass producing my Fordson tractor, so I don't really need that. I got other plans for the Muscle Shoals. Ford envisioned a huge metropolis, 75 miles long, stretching from Seven Mile Island in the Tennessee River all the way to Huntsville. Imagine that. You know, Madison's been worried about being annexed to Huntsville for 30 years and decay. So imagine if it all the way to Huntsville and Madison County running solely on electric power rather than coal power. This giant city would employ one million people and would be a modern decentralized regional industrial center, but also a culture, uh, I mean a utopia, for culture, education, and recreation. Significantly, Ford's new city would, cons would consist of a series of small towns or villages, each powered by electric factories and all connected by modern highways and telephones, what author Thomas Hager describes, quote, as a ribbon city along the river with workers scattered over a green landscape commuting to their jobs, unquote. And Ford himself said, tell the people at the Muscle Shoals that the country roundabout will experience a wave of great prosperity in and around these cities. Property values will increase. And Ford was always his biggest cheerleader. And Ford uh, was referred to by ordinary Americans at the time as Uncle Henry. Uh, he, was a, he was considered to be an honest, hard-working man who uh, rose up. He got to be where he was by his, you know, he rose up by his own bootstraps. He started out as, you know, a humble uh, farm boy, and he grew into one of the richest, most powerful industrialists in the United States, indeed the world. Uh, he had an affinity for the little guy. He always had an affinity for farmers because he had grown up on a farm. He didn't like farming himself but he had an affinity for farmers because he grew up as a farm, as a farm boy. So he, he kind of billed himself as the uh, advocate of the little guy, and people responded. But he was always his biggest cheerleader in the Ford propaganda machine, which was pretty big too. But he got Thomas Edison in on it. Ford had earlier enlisted Edison as his scientific consultant, since Edison knew a little bit about electricity and creating hydroelectric power with dams, though Ford did exaggerate Edison's knowledge of fertilizer, Edison knew almost nothing about fertilizer development. So they kind of fudged that. And that's how they build, build this in the beginning is we're going to do fertilizers. But Edison was just kind of winging it. Nevertheless, nobody could, could mistrust Uncle Henry and, and Uncle Thomas. Ford exaggerated Edison's competence when it came to nitrates and fertilizers. Commenting on Ford, Edison stated, quote, that the development of the industries that Henry Ford proposes to establish at Muscle Shoals will not only give employment to hundreds of thousands of men, but it will increase the wages of everybody in the South. 
I never saw anything like Ford's restless activity. I told him when I saw him Saturday that if there were 500 men like him in this country, we should have St. Vitus's dance, unquote. You know what St. Vitus's dance is, the condition that makes you jerk around as if you're dancing. So, well, about the same time, other interested parties were scoping out the Muscle Shoals. So the Dodge brothers sent their representative to Florence to check out the Muscle Shoals uh, in uh, June of 1921, right around the time Henry Ford made his first visit. And of course this, the, the people think that's a Star of David or a Masonic symbol, but it's actually the Dodge Brothers Motors symbol. The old Fred, what we know is the old Fred's building was built in 1919-1920 as the Tennessee Valley Motor Company, which was a Dodge dealership. And there are actually photos from the 1930s when uh, Kuntz and Parrott were running a Chevy dealership out of that building. But these are still there on the building, and it's not a Masonic symbol. It was a Dodge dealership. And I haven't found any, any more out about the Dodge brothers or their interest. Apparently, they opted not to do anything with it. So on Saturday, December 2nd, 1921, the Twin Wizards, that was another nickname they had, Ford and Edison came to Florence. Keeping his promise to return to the Shoals, Ford with his wife Clara, their son Edsel, Edsel's wife Eleanor, as well as Thomas Edison and his second wife Mina, returned to Florence in Ford's private railway car, the Fairlane, staying until noon, the following Monday, December 4th. So this is a shot of the, and I believe the Ford Company or the museum, the Ford Museum, the Benton Ford, Benson Ford Museum says this is 1923, but I think this may be 1921 because uh, it's got everybody that came to Muscle Shoals on the fair lane. But anyway, they were surprised when the train rolled into the station at Florence and no one was there to greet them. It turned out the crowd had mistakenly gathered at the Sheffield Depot by mistake. So everybody had to rush back over to Florence. Uh, eventually, they were met by what the papers described as a, quote, tremendous crowd, unquote, estimated as not less than 2,000 people in Florence at the depot. And Edison, uh, Edison warmly greeted the children and shook hands with several people. And after lunch, or after an hour for lunch, which was, quote, a fine lot of quail, unquote, delivered to Ford's rail car by a local admirer, the Ford party left to inspect the dam and the nitrate plants. So here's another shot of the fair lane and a couple of views of inside. And the papers didn't say who supplied the quail, just that it was a local resident. When questioned by locals, especially the press, about on Sunday afternoon, Ford stated that his life's work had been to abolish war. He really spun this. This was ultimately why he wanted the Muscle Shoals. Ford told attentive reporters of the Florence Times that if his proposal was accepted by Congress, it would abolish the gold standard, which Ford believed was the root cause of all wars, that and the international Jewish banking conspiracy, because unfortunately Ford was a bit of an anti-Semite. In his uh, Dearborn newspaper, he ran a series of articles uh, extolling his anti-Semitism until he finally realized that nobody was much paying it any attention and he could talk about his Muscle Shoals bid. But he was a bit of an anti-Semite. But uh, Ford believed that gold was the root of all wars. Quote, liberate business from slavery to gold as a basis for currency and you break the money broker's control of world affairs. Ford said. Gold, Ford stated, could be supplanted by what he called energy dollars, produced by water power and other energy resources. His new dollar would also, quote, break the strong, would also break the stranglehold of Wall Street. Displace gold as the standard and you eliminate war. But it wasn't even really necessary to uh, abolish the gold standard, only to issue redeemable, non-interest bearing currency instead of bonds with their heavy interest charges when the government needed to fund a project. And Ford made a big deal out of saying, I don't need the Muscle Shoals, I really don't even want it, but I want to finish and develop it so it can serve the public benefit. And I think a part of him probably really did believe that. I think he really did consider himself the champion of the working guy. Um, at Ford's plant in Detroit, it was not unionized. 
but it didn't need to be. He got, he got a, such good marks by the unions. They said, well, Ford runs such an honest operation and is so good to his employees, they don't even have to unionize. So eventually, organized labor got on board with Ford's bill. And again, he, Ford envisioned the 75-mile-long city of these small uh, towns connected by roads and purely on electric power. A delegation of Tennessee officials led by Governor Taylor joined the Ford Edison party at Nashville, and so they traveled with them the last leg of the journey to Florence. Sunday night, a prominent delegation of citizens from Birmingham arrived in Florence to welcome Ford and Edison and express their support, so everybody was getting on the Ford bandwagon. The next day, Ford was seen in East Florence, quote, bareheaded and alone, unquote, astounding locals as he, quote, wandered through their business section, dropping into stores and meeting people on a basis even as you or I, unquote. So here's Uncle Henry just hanging out with the guys. And I envision, I put this slide together, but maybe he went to the Florence Ice and Coal Company. Said, hey, fellas, how you doing? Let me tell you what I've got, what I got planned. See what you think about this. But he was just ordinary Uncle Henry when he was down here. Sunday afternoon, the Fords and Edison were honored at an impromptu barbecue by State Farm Bureau head Edward A. O'Neill III at his Chestnut Hills Farm on Gunnelford Road, which was attended by a limited number of other invited guests. Later that afternoon, Ford's party was driven to the Muscle Shoals Canal, then back to Florence where they took a brief rest at the home of former Florence Mayor Cyrus W. Ashcraft. So those are those two guys. This is uh, Ford's Chestnut Hills Farm on Gunnelford Road where Diane and Nancy O'Neill live now. That's the historic O'Neill Farm property. And this is the Limestone Manor, which used to be owned uh, by Bill and Carolyn Waterman as a bed and breakfast. And Yeah, Dan, I'm sorry. I always want to do that. Dan and Carolyn Waterman. Uh, and Carolyn says they've got a photo somewhere of Ford and Edison with Ashcraft and O'Neill at... Uh, or at, at, the, at the house, but she couldn't find it in time. Monday morning, Mrs. Edison, accompanied by the Mrs. Ford, paid a call on noted local socialite and widow, Mrs. Camilla Madding Coffey, who with her late husband, A.D. Coffey, is the namesake of the old Coffey High School, at her home on Wood Avenue. Mrs. Edison and Mrs. Coffey had met at a Chautauqua in Chautauqua Lake, New York, several uh, years earlier, and they kind of struck up a, a, a friendship. And of course, this is a photo they got of Henry Ford contemplating the Muscle Shoals and what he might do with it if his bid was successful, which I got from the Benson Ford uh, Museum. Well, when it when it was learned that Ford was interested in the Muscle Shoals, President L.A. May of Birmingham offered him the charter for the Mobile and West Alabama Railroad, but Ford said he really didn't need a railroad. He wasn't interested in railroads, canals, or steam plants. The only, the only interest he had in steam plants was to temporarily power the, the nitrate plants. However, uh, the government was negotiating with the Gorgas Company to sell the steam plant at uh, Nitrate Village number one back to them so Ford might not get the steam plant because they had a contract. And according to, US, to the U.S. Census Bureau, by 1921, the urban population of the Muscle Shoals District, uh, which consisted of the three cities of Florence in Lauderdale County, Sheffield and Tuscumbia in Colbert counties, was 27,000 people in the aggregate. And of course, Muscle Shoals wasn't founded until as a result of the Ford deal. Lauderdale County had 39,556 uh, uh, whites and 8,117 African Americans. Florence itself had 16,000 whites and 2,300 African Americans. Colbert County had an overall population, white population of just over 31,000 and a black population of just over 11,000. Sheffield had a population of 6,800 whites, and I couldn't find stats for African Americans. Tuscumbia had 4,500 whites, and I couldn't find stats 
for African Americans for Tuscumbia, but that gives you the breakdown of the cities. One of these, well, Tuscumbia, I mean, uh, Sheffield kind of had uh, its own boom when it was founded in 1885, but Florence definitely had an industrial boom in, the 18, in 1889. There were about 50 plants located mostly in East Florence in, by June of 1889, and the population was 5,500 by 1889. Uh, until Ford got here in 1921, this was the most excitement on an economic uh, and development level that Florence had seen since that 1880s boom. And of course, the papers were all speculating. One paper, the Salem, Oregon Statesman said, well, you know, this 75 mile long city may be built up at present of castles in the air, but with Ford, who can tell? He may be able to make this thing work after all. So all the papers across the country were speculating. Well, local residents got energized. In December of 1921, Mrs. Roy M. Cooper of Sheffield urged all area residents, black and white, 21 years or older, who supported the Ford bid to write their congressman saying so. And I don't know if they had a letter writing campaign or not, but she tried to get people galvanized. This is a, a bird's eye view of the Tennessee Valley in the Muscle Shoals neighborhood from Scientific American in 1922, kind of their idealized version of what it might look like in the beginning when Ford, if Ford's bid was successful. And of course earlier, in fact in 1897 in January, the Tennessee River Improvement Association was founded in Chattanooga and had Florence delegates that went to those meetings and so it got revitalized because of the Ford deal. And Ford, upon the suggestion of John W. Worthington and General Lansing Beach of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the government's chief dam builders, conferred with Secretary of War John W. Weeks and put in a bid to purchase the Muscle Shoals. Ford bid $5 million for the two nitrate plants and estimated that the U.S. government could complete the dam for a cost of $28 million, which was well below the government's estimated $48 to $50 million and estimated, Ford estimated, that it would only take two years time to complete it instead of the six or eight years it actually did take to complete it. Ford would then pay back the $28 million through a 100-year lease, paying the government 6% per year, which would generate $1.7 million in income for the U.S. government for 100 years, according to Ford. And a lot of people say there's no way any of this could ever have worked. And, but Ford, Ford would, thought it would work, so he really tried to sell it. And of course, they, they put out flyers, they put out uh, printed material. The newspapers, uh, it's like every issue for between December of 1921 and November of 1921, or 1924, every issue of every local paper has something about Ford. Well, one local, I'm sorry, yeah, one local resident who signed his name Sim Pickens, I don't know if that's a real name or a pen name, apparently couldn't really wait on Uncle Henry and had moved to Kansas City, at least if we can go by his poem, by 1921. The Florence Herald ran a poem by Pickens, the first stanza of which read, I've just arrived in Kansas City, found everything just fine. I believe I'll cast my anchor here and travel on the line. I left Florence, Alabama because I could not pay my board. I've done like hundreds of others who depended on Henry Ford. So I don't know if this is legitimate or not, but whoever this poet was, maybe they were just having a little bit of fun, but I thought it was fun. Well, one of the first things that the local people did is the realtors got organized. The real realtors from the three cities in the two counties organized uh, in February of 1922 they organized the Muscle Shoals Real Estate Board with real estate agent Walter H. Glenn as president, Sheffield Realtor E.P. Gaines as vice president, and W.E. Sanford of Sheffield as secretary treasurer. And one of those local realtors was John Downing Whedon, 
Robert Miller Patton's grandson who lived at Sweetwater, which a lot of locals know as the Whedon Plantation home. So he was publishing uh, uh, material with Uncle Henry's photo on it, trying to sell his properties. So this is uh, the Biltmore section of his Whedon Heights subdivision near the present Whedon Elementary School, which is not far from where you live, BC. So from not, this is from, the, uh, the, from 1926, and it's from the Lauderdale County Platte book we have upstairs. You may not be able to see that. That's kind of faint. But this is a map, a newspaper map, showing where his Whedon Heights subdivision is, which exists to this day. Well, local B.B. Garner, a commissioner, county commissioner, sold his 26 acres, including uh, Stewart Springs, which is near Wildwood Park in West Florence, and some improvements for an estimated $10,000. A Dr. C.N. Martin of California bought the property and intended to establish a modern sanitarium on it, which I don't think was ever built, even though the doctor had really elaborate plans that the newspaper reported. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's over there near a uh, Wildwood Park, just beyond UNA's West Campus. Well, even Roosevelt got in on the act, uh, calling for investors. You know, hey, we got land down in Franklin County. If all the land's going to get taken in, in Colbert and Lauderdale counties, we got land down here too. And so some more uh, realist ads for local people, Walter H. Glenn and Company, A.J. Sharp. And then this guy must have been Greek, Nicolopoulos. I tried to research him, but I couldn't find anything else about him. But they all set up offices. The out-of-town realtor set up offices in Sheffield, and maybe some of them in Florence. But Sheffield seems to have been the major headquarters for the realtors. Things began to happen immediately in the Muscle Shoals area. There was an immediate boom in real estate, with property being snatched up by investors from cities like Detroit, Philadelphia, Kansas City, L.A., New York. They came from everywhere. In fact, two ladies from Detroit, the Johnson sisters, Mrs. Ellen Johnson and her sister, were cheated by a Chicago real estate firm, which had bought a big parcel of land near nitrate plant number two for about $250 an acre, broke it up into lots, and resold it. After getting the runaround from the real estate company, they appealed to Henry Ford, who managed to finally get the Johnson sisters the title to their property. Now, Howell and Graves was a real estate development firm headed by Calvin T. Graves and Albert L. Howell, which in 1978 was described by local real estate developer Oscar Medley, quote, as a corporation which had never been. It was a corporation organized in the state of Delaware, maintained in the state of New York, for business in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. The only office it ever had was in the Sheffield Hotel or the Muscle Shoals Hotel, as the owners or as the officers or owners of the company visited here from time to time. They had sales offices here, but never a corporate office, unquote. But I think they actually did have a corporate office, which was involved in their lawsuit, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, their offices were 350 Madison Avenue, New York City. Uh, Howell and Graves were, quote, two of the larger land speculators, developers, shysters, thieves, manipulators, or whatever you want to call them, according to this realtor. Apparently, Howell and Graves made a promotional film titled Muscle Shoals, which has been, been dated to the 1930s, pushing land sales at Muscle Shoals. Uh, and they have it at TVA, or did have it at TVA. They screened it for TVA's 50th anniversary in 1983, because there's a report in the booklet upstairs. Well, these are three newspaper articles from the Winnebago, Nebraska Chieftain from April 26, 1923. In the middle, the New York Daily News of Sunday, May 20th, 1923. And finally, the Boston Globe of Sunday, May 27th, 1923. In April of 1922, upon a complaint filed by the Better Business Bureau of New York City, the case of the people of the state of New York against Alfred L. Howell and Calvin T. Graves was tried before Magistrate Simpson in the municipal court for the unauthorized use in their literature of the names and intimate pictures of President Harding, Henry Ford, and Thomas A. Edison by the display of an altered map 
and by a high-pressure sales campaign in which their licensed salesmen have, unwarrant, have made unwarranted statements. Howell and Graves are selling 80 acres of, un, of subdivided farm, swamp, and woodland in Colbert County, Alabama at an asking price of $642,000 or $642,605. And Howell and Graves only paid $24,000 for this property. And they were selling it for $642,000. When Ford and Edison found out through their PR people, they were not happy campers about their likenesses being used in ad campaigns designed to swindle people because they really do seem to have been honest. Ford did not like his likeness being used to cheat people, especially honest, hardworking Americans. So Ford charged his personal assistant, Ernest Leibold, with investigating, and Leibold had Ford employees pose as buyers and report back. Ford then fired off a cease and desist letter to Howell and Graves. Then the firm was hauled into court on the charge of false advertising. To the charges, Colonel William Rand, the Wall Street attorney who represented Howell and Graves, argued that, quote, his clients were adhering to Henry Ford's business ideas with the slogan, stick to Henry Ford and you'll wear diamonds. In other words, we're just saying what Uncle Henry said. You can't blame us. It's not our fault. Howell and Graves were acquitted, with Magistrate Simpson stating, quote, I am not called upon to pass judgment upon the good or bad taste of the strenuous and persistent character of the advertising campaign by which they've sought to market these properties. My duty is ended when I find, as I do, that there is no substantial evidence to justify a finding that they have violated any provision of the penal law, unquote. So they got acquitted. And I don't exactly know when they went out of business, uh, but they continued for several more years developing property at the Muscle Shoals. And so Howell and Graves continued selling lots at Muscle Shoals. In 1928, the Howell Graves Junior High School, now the offices of the Muscle Shoals City Board of Education, at 3300 Wilson Dam Road in Muscle Shoals was built which was the result of a 1927 proposal by Howell and Graves that a $60,000 building be erected via a $20,000 donation by the firm and the issuance of school district warrants in the amount of $40,000 in the newly developed neighborhood they were developing uh, in exchange for the current school lot, which would be deeded to the state of Alabama by Howell and Graves. Howell and Graves agreed to buy the $40,000 in warrants, provided $30,000 be issued against a district tax and $10,000 against a county tax. So Harry J. Fraun was hired as the architect, and the firm of Hearn and Company of Sheffield was the building contractor, and the cornerstone was laid May 26, 1928. And according to the newspapers, it was built and done by June of 1928. They moved into it not long after that. And Howell and Graves' uh, real estate interest in the Muscle Shoals area were bought by Oscar Medley and his local Medley Land Company in 1978. And it was at this time that he found that film, a documentary promotional film, The Muscle Shoals, that Howell and Graves made uh, to drum up a business. Well, as you can see from this, from G. Frank Croissant of the National Sales Organization, uh, of Chicago, they need salesmen to sell property at the Muscle Shoals. And the newspapers, every time a Chicago party came down or a Detroit party came down or a Philadelphia party came down, the papers would report it. So in this case, in October of 1922, a party of Chicago and Detroit people were visitors. And again, they came from everywhere. Kansas City, Virginia, Detroit, uh, everywhere. New York, Philadelphia. I mean, even the Battle Creek Inquirer from Battle Creek, Michigan got involved in, and they're the home of Kellogg's. They started out as a sanitarium, and I think the cereals were eventually, or uh, started out as health food. But everybody got in on this, and everybody, it seems like the whole country or most, well, from the newspapers, it seems like most of the newspapers were for the Ford bid. And most, there was a sizable opposition, which we'll get to a little later on. But a lot of people were for it. I mean, 
investors, the Darrelltown subdivision in what is now Muscle Shoals, investors. Uh, this is one <coughs> near, not too far from Whedon Heights. It's actually off of Huff Road near the, the present Walmart called Fordson Heights, named after Ford's tractor. And they've got several maps of it in the plat books upstairs of what it would look like. So it's right off of Huff Road. And then there was Ford City, which you probably all heard of, which they had huge big dreams for it. And it's just a wide spot in the road now. And I understand there are uh, cow pastures with sidewalks going nowhere. And uh, there, when I did this program at ILR last year, a lady said, yeah, my family owned property near Ford City, and it's still tied up in litigation a hundred years later, which blew my mind. But it, there were sidewalks and streets, and there's still some Yeah, you, you can see them. I oh, tried to find a... No, this is just off 2nd Street, yeah, like on John th there are There are all over 2nd Street. people have pilfered all those beautiful old light fixtures. I tried to find photos of some, but I couldn't. Yeah. But here's another one, Lee Highway Heights. We can go pick up our heads out there. Interesting. Well, they even had some, a lot of subdivisions in Florence that were planned, like the Burl School subdivision for African Americans on College Street near the Burl, uh, Burl Slater School, or the Burl School, this was before the merger. I don't know if it was actually built or not. This is just an interesting photo of one of the Nyhoff developments in Sheffield on Jackson Highway from some point during the Ford <coughs> bid. Of course, they published a map, the local, a local realtor published a map showing where all these planned development, and most of these were never built, or if they were, they were not as big as they intended them to be. You can see how massive Ford City was planned to be. Well, here's a, a map. I know you can't read those names, but I platted out, it because you can't read the names. It's on this map. The names are kind of small. So I got... Uh, I think 84 proposed subdivisions in two counties during, during the, between 1921 and really 1926 and 7 because they kept developing some of them after the Ford deal fell through with names like Bluegrass, Burl Heights, Burl School, Lake Million, uh, Millionaire Lake, Montgomery Manor. Uh, and you'll notice there was one just southwest of Tuscumbia called Electric City. I don't think Thomas Hager knew that, but that's really cool. I don't know that it was ever built, but they planned it. They had one called, named after Ford's son, Edsel. So they had one named after Edison. So there's, yeah, I actually got 87 that I could read off the map with some of those plat books helping me out. And these are not all of them. These are just the ones I could, that I could read from the map and the plat books. Well, they had to build sidewalks, as we've already talked about. So... In December 8th, 19, on December 8th, 1922, the Muscle Shoals Land Company authorized the laying of 48 miles of sidewalks in the Highland Park subdivision adjoining nitrate plant number two, which is in Muscle Shoals now, said to be, quote, the biggest sidewalk contract ever made in North Alabama, unquote. And I don't know if any of these sidewalks are ever built. Some of them may have been. Some of them are still there. Yeah, I know the ones on 2nd Street were built. And maybe these adjoin some of those, but 48 miles blows my mind. Well, Cyrus Ashcraft, an industrialist and former mayor of Florence, uh, founded his own company in November of 1922. He owned property down in Colbert, so he founded the Alabama Mineral Company and the Alabama Rock Asphalt Company with the same officers for both companies that would develop the asphalts near Littleville, in Colbert County, in the south, southeast corner of, Lauder, of uh, Colbert County. And of course I mentioned that the Union labor backed Ford. By 1923, they had decided they were going to throw in with Ford. And water power investors also came down from several northern states in December of 1922. 
one of the most fascinating to me aspects of the whole Ford deal is Colonel Roscoe Turner. Corinth, the Mississippi native and famed barnstormer Colonel Roscoe Turner, who in 1923 established the Muscle Shoals Aircraft Corporation, and in 1925 a flight school at Gusmus Field was in charge of, of an airfield. He set up shop at the Sheffield Hotel in October of 1923. Turner founded the Muscle Shoals Aircraft Corporation, whose capital stock was $50,000, consisting of 500 shares at $10 each. E.C. Carter was president with Colonel Turner as vice president and general manager. And according to the advertisements in the Sheffield Standard, several local investors bought stock in the company. In April of 1925, Turner christened three new planes named the Florence, the Sheffield, and the Tuscumbia. The largest of these planes, according to the Sheffield Standard, was, quote, the largest passenger carrying plane in the southern states and will be on ex exhibition Sunday at the Ford City Flying Field. In April of 1925, Turner started a flight school at Gusmus Field near Ford City, being assisted in conducting the school by Captain W.H. Moeller and A.H. Starnes. On April 4th, the Florence Times reported that five men, three locals, as well as one from Tennessee and one from Mississippi had signed on as students. So he actually had a few students. Turner left Sheffield in 1927, however his connection to the area continued through Reeder Nichols, a native of East Florence, Alabama. Nichols served as radio man for Turner and his co-pilot Clyde Pangburn in the famed 1934 McRobertson Air Race from London to Melbourne in which the trio flying the Warner Brothers Comet, a modified Boeing 24-7D, placed third, winning a $2,000 prize. So, and Reader Nichols has a mountain named after him in Australia where he moved after World War II, guy from East Florence, Alabama. But by late 1927, Turner was pushing a bid for a U.S. government airmail contract between Birmingham and Chicago, which was said to uh, include an airstrip near the Bailey Springs in Lauderdale County. So they had big plans for redeveloping Bailey Springs, the old famous resort, about six or eight miles north and east of Florence. This is what the, the company, uh, the, the, the place looked like. It's a trailer park now, unfortunately. But that didn't really materialize either. And so it was April of 1932 before Florence finally got an airfield at O'Neill Harbor in Florence, which is now known as McFarland Park. The landing strip was back off in here somewhere, and it was open for six or eight years, but there was, used to be an airstrip at McFarland. Well, the local real estate companies, uh, like the Strickland Lumber Company, who published the Strickland Co. News in the Florence Herald, were advertising for more houses as the building boom was unabated as Florence grows. We got to have more houses to meet the need of all these people coming down for the Ford bid. Well, even the Southern Tire Company got in on the Ford mania and said, corn whiskey for Ford cars is not the proper fuel. They should use a high test gasoline. We have it. So he was running a special on gasoline, but quote, only until Henry Ford gets the dam or the prices advance. We're expecting both at once, so buy yours now. Don't cuss, phone for the yellow bus. Yes, that was fun too. Well, the politicians like uh, former Governor Edward A. O'Neill, I'm sorry, excuse me, Emmett O'Neill, Edward's son, uh, got on board. Both Ford and Edison were certain the government would get on board with Ford's proposal, and they said so to the press in no uncertain terms. Local officials such as Florence resident and former Alabama governor Emmett O'Neill endorsed the Ford bill, and locals were certain Uncle Henry was going to be their savior. And I'll try to wind it down because it's 6.30. I don't want to go over too long. Uh, President Harding had favored development of Muscle Shoals, 
In February of 1922, the Ford Bill went before Congress. However, as usual, Congress was slow in its deliberations. The administration of Republican President Harding had already stated that it had virtually decided to accept the Ford offer. Of course, Wall Street and corporations like the National Fertilizer Association, Alabama Power, and the Air Nitrate Corporation had opposed the Ford Bill. Well, General Lansing Beach of the Army Corps of Engineers, the, uh, the nation's chief dam builder, from day one had been on board with Ford. While initially supporting the Ford bid, Secretary Weeks quickly came to see it as a vague, ill-defined uh, bid with the cost vastly underestimated. Remember, Ford estimated some $28,000 to complete a $50,000 dam. Secretary Weeks thought that Ford had drastically miscalculated and underbid. Plus, federal law stipulated a lease deal that topped out at 50 years and not Ford's 100 years. Yet Ford, in two and a half years of his Ford bid or so, never altered his proposal. Finally, in March of 1924, the Ford bill passed the House by a vote of 227 to 142. However, Ford's plans were defeated in the Senate due to the untiring efforts of Republican Senator George W. Norris of Nebraska, who didn't think a complex like the Muscle Shoals should be in private hands, but instead developed by the federal government. And there were other industrialists and uh, old money families that were opposed to Ford, like the DuPonts and the James B. Duke uh, tobacco magnates. There was no love lost between Ford and any of these guys, so they were opposed to Ford. And while Alabama Congressman Oscar W. Underwood, well, at first he supported Ford, then he switched to Alabama Power, then he switched back to Ford, then he switched back to Alabama Power, and eventually he came out against Ford on the side of Alabama Power, and eventually uh, he, he just flip-flopped. But these are other corporations, a few other corporations that bid, put in a bid for the Muscle Shoals along with Ford. Alabama Power did everything they could to throw a wrench into the monkey works. Uh, finally, in June of 1922, the Ford bill went before the House of Representatives. Ed Allman called for its acceptance. About this time, Henry Ford was kind of toying with the idea of running for president, kind of like Trump in the first election. Maybe I'll run, maybe I won't. Don't know which party I'm going to come out for. Ford was impulsive, hated experts of any kind, and refused to commit to a platform, specific policies, or even a political party. Instead, he ran for Senate in 1918 and kind of for president in 1924 on his reputation as a captain of industry and a force of nature. Uh, he didn't even pick a party. President Calvin Coolidge had become president upon the unexpected death of President Harding. Coolidge made a deal with Ford that he would use his influence to get Ford the Muscle Shoals if Ford agreed not to run for president, which Ford agreed to do. And President Coolidge was quoted as saying, quote, I am friendly to Mr. Ford, but wish someone would convey to him that it is my hope that Mr. Ford will not do or say anything that will make it difficult for me to deliver the Muscle Shoals to him, which is what I'm trying to do. So Coolidge came under a lot of fire for being in cahoots with Ford to get reelected as president. But Norris continued his opposition and so on October 1924, a frustrated Henry Ford withdrew his bid to purchase the Muscle Shoals. With it died his dream of a 75 mile long city with a million workers founded with a, the stated aim of abolishing war. Norris had an alternate version which included development of the entire Tennessee River as a resource for all taxpayers, including not only power, but also navigation, forestry, and agriculture. Thus, the Tennessee Valley Authority, or TVA, was born, but not until 11 years later, 1933, after FDR was elected president. Until that time, people in the Shoals had little use for Senator Norris from Nebraska. For his part, FDR made two inspection tours of the nitrate plants in Wilson Dam in January of 1933 and again in November of 1934. And this is his first 
inspection tour of the Muscle Shoals. And this is Edward Allman. It kind of looks like George Norris, but it's Edward Allman. So this is Roosevelt at the Sheffield Train Depot, January 21st. It should be 21st, 1934. So I'm going to cut it off here. I had a few more slides, but since I'm over a little bit, the development did not stop. The momentum carried on at least until the Great Depression hit in 1929. They continued to try to develop the Muscle Shoals. They made uh, promotional movies. Howell and Graves kept selling property. Uh, and it really kept going until the Great Depression hit in 1929. And then with FDR's New Deal policies, and the creation of TVA, that radically changed everything. So thank you for being here and your attention. If anybody's got any really quick questions, I'll be glad to take them.